to you about basically predators and predation. Um, I do raise and breed livestock guardian dogs. I have an intense passion for them. Um, I started out with goats in 1985 um, on the, the big island of Hawaii. And we had lots of predators, and so you'll see some of the information from those islands. I've been in um, California, up in the high mountains with cats and bear. And uh, now I live along the uh, Tennessee River, and we have um, other predators that are coming in. So I've had to take some um, different routes of looking at how I work with um, predators. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, so why do we even want to think about predators and predation. Think about your monetary investment into your um, livestock and think about um, how do you deal with pets. Some people don't deal with it real well. So um, why are we really concerned about protecting? And just remember, livestock guardian dogs are insurance. So you're insuring your dogs also for about two, two million and they are taking care of your goats. Livestock guardian dogs are for goats. They are not for you. So they're not pets. So I want to get that right out. Um, we all love rainbows. We like water because we've got to have water for um, everything that we do. And then um, all of a sudden you're thinking, wow, that looks like room and floor. Whoa, there's a little bit of blood there. What could have happened along the Cumberland River? And you go and you see intense devastation. This is a um, mature Kiko weather, five years old, 225 pounds, decimated by pack dogs. What are pack dogs? They're pets. They could be Rottweilers, they could be um, Fuku dogs. Fuku dogs get together and they can do kills too. And so now you've lost this animal. Think about this goat. He's on a, a browsing project. You're making between two to three thousand dollars a week on this project, and now you're starting to lose your main source of eating vegetation. This is a young animal. If you if you look at this point right here, you can see where um, it's, she's been bitten right across the top. The skin has just been pulled out. It's like ripping off a pocket. And then you look back here, and you see dig marks. This tells you that it was a mountain lion. Mountain lions drop out of trees. Front feet go in front of the shoulders. They bite, take it right out, and they dig into the back so that um, they can get a really good grip for the rest of the kill. Try to save this individual. Here's the scapula. And you can look right through the hole here, down into the lung of the heart. And um, there wasn't any way to um, take care of this animal except um, for real. Here we have um, an individual that was um, attacked by another set of pack dogs. And um, we need to see this goat. And she did have to carry a twin. So now you're going to go and find out whose dogs killed this goat. Why are we going to do that? How much was this doe worth? This doe was four years old. Okay, she's worth, I don't know, four or five hundred dollars. She's carrying twins. Each of these twins has an opportunity to be a breeding goat. If you keep really good records, and you have your five kept records since 1985, so if you have really good records, and you can prove the lineage of these goats, and you can prove how many years they are in your herd, and now you have their kids, we can sex these little guys, what are they going to produce? So you just don't sue for four or five hundred dollars. Now we're talking between thirty-five thousand and fifty thousand dollars. You're suing for the life expectancy of all the project because that's what you're going to lose. I think that this is a business. And um, so we have to be with the building. Here's another little guy. It's like, why did this guy die? If you just pick them up and you look at them, you're thinking, okay, this producer took really good care of him, dipped the navel, um, made sure he was healthy. Your tag
bag, and you're just looking over um, this kid. And you, you, you're looking real close. And all of a sudden you see a little something here, maybe a little bit there, and you're just looking. And you're trying to figure, why did my kid die? This is before you need proxy, or you take them to your vet to have it done. You roll them over, and what do you find? Teeth marks, bite marks, rip marks. This was a um, coyote kill. So why do we worry? This producer will tell you he's no longer raising goats or sheep. He lost 23 in this kill and came across the Duck River, two rock wipers in a pit, and they wiped him out with 23. And these, these animals were all pregnant. He totally lost his business. So, what's his long-term monetary effect? Zero. I mean, he's completely wiped out. He has nothing to sell. How's he going to pay his banker? If anybody in here is a banker, I can tell you you've always got your hands sticking out waiting for payments. So, how is he going to pay for his loss? What about the hurt stress? Fred talked about stress. This is another type of stress. Because now, this whole group, there are, I think there were only like four or five left that we managed to keep alive. But they were like one goat. And there was a sheep in this group. And they moved like they were one animal. They were so scared to split. But, so the consumption pattern changes. So if you're trying to do rotational grazing, if you're trying to do um, diversified production, now you have a lot of other problems because of what happened. But what about the effect on the guardian dogs? What do you think happened to the dog that was responsible for these sheep and goats? He had one job. All the goats are now browsing in a mob. The rock goat hit, the dogs come across the river. The mob split. Now you have two mobs, one dog. Where is the dog going? Who's he going to protect? He's totally responsible for all these animals. He takes it as an intense responsibility to protect them. This dog gave up. This dog almost died. The dog gave up, and I told him, the producer, I'll take your dog, and I'll take him home, and I'll try and rehab him for you. I took him home and I treated him like a puppy. And it took me six months to bring him back around to work behind guardian dogs. And he eventually became a really good guardian. Now, if you're going to take somebody else's dog home, you take him to somebody like Dr. Fred, who's got a deep bath full of disinfectant, and you scrub the heck out of him before you um, take these dogs home. And what about the human? What, what do you think happened to this man's wife? He did a lot better than she did. She slept with her 30-30 along the river until those dogs were dead floating down the river. That's what we call sheep shovel and shovel. <laughs> so here's your concept of looking at the dogs that um, there's many different breeds of dogs. So you want to look at how do they respond to predators. You want them to look at a predator straight in the eye, dead. Do not give them the opportunity to get in your fence. If they're in, they're dead. And so I'm really a nice person. I really am. Fine. Jamie, back me up on that. <laughs> they have to be very instinctive in how they um, react. You can't train livestock guardian dogs. You facilitate them to be successful. And I brought up my books. It, it teaches you in there, it talks you in there about how to facilitate guard dogs. You want to go and see the, the dam, the sire. You want to actually see them working out in the field. You want to see how they react. If you're going to buy a younger dog, you want to see those younger animals out there with the stock and how they react to those livestock. They have to remain with the herd. I hear horror stories about, yeah, my dog runs away and then it gets killed. 
well, we, can, we have some ways to fix that. And they have to respect the livestock. You don't want them nipping them. You don't want them chasing them. I like to see when I look out early in the morning, my goats have just came, come in from their 3.30 to 5.30, 6 o'clock little browse. They're all laying down. And I'm thinking, where are my dogs? So you just kind of walk around the mob, and all you see is this tail going up and down. I'm over here. I'm over here. And the dogs are right in the group. Or you've got a dog on patrol. You always have two or more dogs to a mob, and you double dog and kidding. So when I kid, I've got six or seven dogs out there. So you want to really protect these animals. They have to be very confident. You don't want a dog that's like really shocked and kind of looks at the goats and says, I don't know. And then when a predator comes by, he runs to the goats and says, protect me, help me. <laughs> and then you have to look at them for their environmental versatility. How do they fit into um, what your project is going on? So we're gonna think, we're gonna select them by the type of predator. Do we have neighbors' dogs? Do we have buzzards? Um, do we have wolves, mountain lions, bears? So we need to know what type of predator we have, and then we can look at the different breeds of dogs, because some of them work better with different types of predators. And what is your climate? I used to raise great peers up in the mountains where it snowed. I moved to Tennessee. I don't raise them anymore. It's too hot. They get hot spots. They only want to, be, they want to be with the goats, but if the goats aren't where it's cool, so then I ended up shearing them, and I hate shearing sheep. I love the werewolf, but <laughs> I don't like to shear it. What vegetation type do you have? If you're in a lot of blackberries, you're in Osage orange, it gets, their fiber gets hung up in it, and then you gotta go cut them out of the bushes. And what are the genetics? Does the muck has this bit of benefit? They're from a family that guards, they're from a family that is out there working all the time, or somebody is just raising them and selling pups. They might have a goat in a pen and puppies near the um, They better keep work. These are just, um, so, somebody told me one time, these guys are so cute. Yeah, and they eat too. <laughs> And we've got, you know, coyotes, we've got mountain lions, bobcats, wolves, we've got all different um, types of um, predators. These dudes, I have some dogs that hate birds. And um, I love finding dead buzzards. I hang them on a fence. <laughs> you think you hang these guys on a fence? The other buzzards go by and I they don't want to be part of a fence line. And so um, I don't uh, deal with these guys. The dogs will take them out. <coughs> I know now you don't have to really get a permit, but I do apply for my permit, and I ask for um, 300 birds a year. So what other, what other predators do we have? We've got fire ants. If you have um, any type of fire ants and somebody kids near those fire ants, that'll kill your little kids. Um, we've got bobcats. Snakes. Snakes are real interesting. Um, I found a dead doe one day. Down, she just, she kidded me two or three days before, and I found her down in a little gully. <coughs> My first thought is, how am I going to get her out of the gully to figure out why she got before I call my, my vet and tell them I'm going to necropsy a goat, can I send stuff off to um, the local lab? And so when I, I pulled her back up, I got my four-wheeler, pulled her out of the gully, and when I went to roll her over to necropsy her, she had thousands of big holes all over her body. She had heated by a bunch of little snakes. What was really interesting, though, her little kids never got bit, but she died. So be real careful. We have foxes, raccoons, possums. We're going to talk about humans later, but wild pigs. I worked a lot in the Hawaiian Islands um, with wild pigs. We use the um, guard dogs 
will let you know where the wild pigs are. Then we come in with um, black mouth curs, leopard catahoulas, and they work the pig until it can no longer withstand any more pressure. And then we bring in the dogo argentinos that are bone crushers, and they just crush them to death. So we use, you know, the different types of dogs. I've been working a lot down on a river where we have a lot of bobcats. We now have um, red wolves that come in. We have bear, and we now have a cat. And uh, what I ended up doing, never used to my college before, but I had a dog and I called Dr. Fred. I said, Dr. Fred, I took my dog to the vet and he's got tubes coming out all over and he's draining. So now when I'm on a river, I put on my spike collars and um, I haven't had a dog hurt since, but. So here are some of the different um, types of dogs that the different breeds, there's all different breeds. People usually pick the breed that they think they like. They don't pick it on the type of predators they have or how the dog is going to work in their situation. This dog, I've always felt sorry for him. I don't know how he sees anything. <laughs> and that means I great peers. A lot of people really like peers, but this is the long fiber. Um, if you saw this guy without his fiber, you'd think he was a skinny pup. Um, he's eight or ten years old here. But what I did in California, I used these dogs as my backup because we had bear and cats. So the, the, um, the, the Akbash would go in, they're high speed, and these guys would be coming in to back them up for the kill. Um, these, these are really quiet dogs. They, they, just, they don't bark a lot, but when they do, you better be listening. And they're a lot more people tolerant than um, some of the other breeds. That's why people seem to make pets out of them. This is a breed of dog, the Kangal. A lot of people are scared of this breed, and I understand why. When you look at this guy, he, he looks okay right here. But if you look him in the eye, he knows that your throat is available, and he doesn't um, take a step back. They're really fast dogs. They're made for wolves. This dog I breed. Most of my pups go to um, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, until they go out west, where they have a lot of wolf problems. Some going now into um, Oregon and Washington. They are dogs that um, are taught to work in a pack. So you work them, depending on the type of predator they're going into, if they're going into a bunch of wolves, you need to have three or four of these that you're raising, and you're raising them as pack dogs because wolves fight the pack, and these kangles also learn to um, fight in a pack. Would you like to see that face in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. People who come to my farm, they stand at my gate, and they wait for me <laughs> because this is their first introduction to you are not welcome. Here's some kangle cups. Um, they're always kept with goats that are bigger than they are. They're taught, look at all this poly wire here. This is a very hot fence. And look at these little pups. I have um, some other dogs on this side because what I'm trying to do is tempt the puppies to challenge the fence. I set it up. I facilitate it. They're the ones that say, uh -uh, I'm not touching this again. And when one pup touches it, they tell all the other pups, and that ends that problem. Here's a little Kangle pup. Look at how he, his body conformation, his tail's down, so he is relaxed at this point. But look at that face. If you can see these eyes better, he's on a total stare. Their eyes aren't moving. He's already tuned in to what he's going to go Akbash. There's several different types of Akbash, and we're going to look at those in a second. This is a Canadian Akbash, heavy boned female. Um, they do have double coats. They, they shed that um, heavy coat um, in the summer. These dogs are really interesting because um, you can be out in your field, and they'll, you go to them. You never have the dog come to you. So I'm out in the field with the goats, and I walk up to the dog, and they sit down, and I just give them a pat on the head. And before I can even take my hand off them, they're gone. 
I didn't hear anything, I don't see anything, and they come back half an hour, 45 minutes later, you're somewhere else in the field, they come back, they sit down beside you, and you look at them and they're all covered in blood. And you think, how can they turn on and shut off that fast and come back to the mob and go, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> These are the different types of um, akbash. We have this, the real heavy body dogs that you just saw. And then um, these are some of the uh, lighter body dogs. This is a female and a male. These are the dogs that the Canadians use to cut over timber. These dogs are really fast. They can really jump. And um, the heavier bodies come in and um, they're backups. And here they are just in three strand poly wire fence. Um, this is uh, an Anatolian. This is um, Tommy Van's dog in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Very effective dog. His love was little kids. So if you can find a dog and you're working with a group of dogs, like I have 15 working right now, and some of the dogs just really, well, some of them like the older dogs, some of them like yearlings, and there's some of them that just love little kids. And you want to be able to read those dogs and know where to put them for when you need their help. So one of the ways you learn how to read dogs is you make ham and cheese on rye, put some lettuce in there. The goats will eat the lettuce, the dogs eat the ham, and you get stuck with the room. <laughs> so when I started thinking about different dogs, um, when I lived in the um, islands of Hawaii and started, you know, and I came to California, I did raise um, great peers. Um, and I have, have since, I have nothing against them, please don't take me wrong. They just have too much fiber, and I've, you know, started looking at um, the Akbash and then um, the Kangle. I've stayed away from the Kuzma, mainly because these are, these are Russian bred dogs, and they're bred to kill anything that includes humans. So I sort of, you know, kind of stayed away um, from that one. I was looking at um, the dogs that, you know, s you know, stayed with the goats, and I went, that match is like 71%. Marema, I was talking to somebody that has a Marema that really likes them. Um, but I decided to go with the Akbash because they were shorter haired. I would like to have done some of this research with Dr. Woodruff. He got to spend a couple of years out on different ranches collecting all this information. And so you want, to, you want the dogs that are exceedingly effective. That means if, if you don't have a problem and you have dogs, they're very effective. If you have some dogs and you still have a predation problem, you need to reevaluate those dogs. They may not be the right breed for you. They may not be the type of dog that is really aggressive enough to go out and um, do some damage. And this is what I like about the Akbash. It was 100% aggressive predators, and it was 92% aggressive to other dogs. I lived in California. We had lots of pack dogs. Everybody come home from work. Even though I lived in the middle of nowhere, they come home from work, they leave their dogs go outside, and then about 10 o'clock at night, they wonder why their dog didn't come home. We had a policy, you shoot shovel and you shut up. And if your dog killed somebody's dog, you buried it. And uh, my policy was, I planted a rose bush for every dog that my dogs killed. When I left California, I had a beautiful rose garden with 23 bushes. And then, what is the economics of having a dog? Think about it. Okay, some people are like, well, I have to buy dog food, so I get the cheapest stuff. Don't cheap your dogs. I pay 40 bucks for a 40 pound bag of dog food. But if you buy high quality food, you don't feed as much. And you feed your dogs early in the morning because they've been out all night on a kill or looking for something to kill. So I feed my dogs early in the morning. They take their naps with the goats around 10 to noon, and they're going to work the rest of the day. 
I don't want to feed my dogs at night. Now they got a tummy full of food, and I'm expecting them to work. I mean, if you eat a lot of food at 6 o'clock at night, you want to go out and do a bunch of work until 4 o'clock in the morning? I don't think so. So my policy is I feed my dogs um, early in the morning, and I expect them to go out and work. So then you have your benefits. You've got rabies vaccinations. You've got seven-way. Then you've got, if you're in an area that um, has a lot of ticks, I test my dogs for um, some of the tick diseases. But what if you just need one dose? The dogs pay for it, so if you say go. So I, to me, they're my insurance policy. So how are you going to select them? Um, I don't expect. Um, my dogs to be breeding age until they're at least two years of old, two years of age, and I expect them to be having been out there working as a pup. They have to work as a yearling, and they have to have good body structure, great sound legs, and that's why I do, um, on my dogs, I have all the ONAs um, done on their hips. I also do the shoulders, and um, for another 10 or 15 bucks, my vet will take a, a shot from their, their shoulders to their hips, and we can look at the spinal column, because I did have a bone or a dog one time that had a little twist in their spine. Um, and so, just trying to um, look at them, and I, then I won't use them for breeding if they don't meet my requirements. I expect my, the dam, when she has her pups, there's a pack of little pups right here. She's gonna whelp out in the brush, She's going to whelp when I'm kidding. So when these little pups begin to wobble around on those little toothpicks and they have, you know, one eye up, <coughs> little zoats stand in there and they think it's some big monster. Um, well, they need to know them like right at birth. So I'd like to, you know, whelp them with the stock, raise them with the stock. And I always ask everybody when I do this picture, which pup would you buy? Would you buy the one on the right? the guy on the left. Who's going to take a pick and gamble? Just remember, if you don't get the right puppy, you don't get lunch. <laughs> Anybody want to take a choice on which puppy you buy? One with its head up. Pardon? One with its head up. Really? He's looking at me. I don't want him looking at me. I want him to be thinking about where this goes go. Why can't I see that? Here he is when he's a little older. Look at him again. Is he looking at me? Nope. But look at how tight he is with these. This is a group of little bucklings. Look at how tight he is. Maybe they're from the wings. One of the two. Look at how tight he's bonded with his goats. And he's got a, a, a goat laying down here. He's actually leaning up against this guy. And this guy's got his back legs on this little pup. Angles, when you start selecting them, they're a little different. Um, they're, notice they're with a group of young dolings that are bigger than they are. But look at the wheel on this pup. This is what you call a wheel. When their tail comes up over the back, it means I'm business. I'm looking. And this little pup is looking for his job. These other guys, yeah, they're coming along with the rest of the group. So when you're out there evaluating these pups, these are all microchipped. So if you wonder how I know what pup is what, they're chipped. So I can come back in and go, okay, this is the pup that is with the red goat. This is his number. And I can keep my eye on that pup. And the next pup that I would be evaluating would be this guy right here. So when I evaluate pups, I'm usually looking at them for me to pick one out, and then I look at how do all of those pups work as a pack, because these goats are all going back out to uh, Northern California. Here's my pup pick. He's got this real, real tight. Here's number, this is number 52. Um, so he's coming in the brush. He's working his way through here. And once again, notice how these goats are real calm around these dogs. There is no um, antsiness with the goats. They're, they're not stressed out, and so 
this is great because what's going to happen when these uh, when these little dolings hit, or they go to somebody else's farm to kid, and they've got dogs. Those little dolings are just going to look and go, okay, another dog. And remember, when you put your dog out with goats, the first thing they want to do is sniff buds. And that's how they identify all of the goats that are in their mom is by going up and, and sniffing their butt. So these little guys are very calm around that whole um, situation. Here's one of my fences. Once again, I like the winter. It's just really tight um, through here. You can only put 90 PSI on this um, poly wire. It'll snap the nine little strands that are in it. So um, some of my fences sag, but um, I put fence down lower because of little pups. Just remember when pups are little, if you ever just walk up to them and you look at them, they're, they're walking along and their little eyes are kind of crossed because they're trying to focus on that wire and the next thing you know, poof, it's like, whoa, the wire's right there. It's the last time I'll touch it. But I'm really a nice person. <laughs> These two angles decided they were not going to get along. We don't do that on my farm. You're going to get along. So what I did was I put them in my goat toe. They can't get up too high to get a good charge in a fight on the other one. They can growl. And then what I do is I feed them with one hand. They have to eat together. And they get a bucket of water. So. I leave them there, but they're in the shade. We take good care of them. And as soon as they're both laying side by side, then I'll put them out with a mob of those. And if they continue being really peaceful and quiet, I'm happy. And as soon as they're not, and this bike drives into that crate, they go, we'll change, we'll make it work. Super good work. <laughs> You just have to facilitate them. You have to figure out how you can make them think that they're solving their own problem. You don't want them to think that it's you. You want to be incognito. Uh, here's a partnership deal. You know, this, you've got a dog looking to the east, one looking to the west. There's actually um, five or six pups in here. Um, this is a group of them. Um, they're doing teamwork. The other two dogs are out wandering around. Now, these are older peers. They're with the group of clean um, off weathers. And it, it's nice because these are market weathers. And they're not stressed out. So I'm not losing any weight on these guys. We've got respect. They're browsing right up to the, the Akbash. And the dogs and the goats, they trust each other. And that's what I'm looking for in my mom. You know how little kids can be. They want to go out and they, this is, this is called the trampoline dog. Um, they just come up, they're bouncing all over this poor dog. And he just looks at them and says, oh gosh, you guys are back. Yep, they're back. But he'll, he'll just get up and walk away if he doesn't want to be bothered. I, I neuter and spay all of my dogs that are going to be used for work. I don't want them deciding they're going to go out and breed something. I don't want dogs coming in to breed my females. I run my production dogs, my intact dogs, in a whole different type of situation. <coughs> this is um, a group that are out on a fire project of um, weathers. They're just being pulled in to go on to the next um, timber project. There's 700 goats in this, this corral type situation getting ready to be loaded out on a big truck. There's 12 dogs in here. These are all great peers. We had a lot of snow up in the Sierra Nevadas, so they they did work um, really well. These, these guys never got shorn because they were in snow all winter and it was cold up in the forest um, during the summer. When we're loading up a big truck, we leave out how many of how many dogs go up with the goats. When we open the, the pen and we've got our big trailer sitting there, 
we count the, the, the dogs that'll go in and we leave off four goats every dog that goes up there because we want those dogs to be able to lay down and not get trodden on um, by the goats. And it's interesting because the goats will really let their dogs go up first. When we come into this browsing project with a big trailer, maybe three or four trailers, um, and there's dogs on board, the dogs are waiting right at that back gate, some near the ramp, some down on the bottom. They're waiting to get out because those dogs know they go out into the forested area, they patrol. If those dogs come back, then the goats can go. If those dogs don't come back, I go get my 30 30 and I can see why they didn't come back. Sometimes the fence is down, sometimes you'll see a bear up in a tree. So if we find that, then we've got to pull out, we give the bear a couple days to go away, and then we'll come back and try that area again. Always thinking about how are we going to facilitate these dogs to be successful, not just for me, but for the goats they have to watch. Um, this is a group of pups in here, little Akbash pups, and they're coming out to work with this mob of goats. And so I just put this panel up in the back of my trailer. All the other dogs and the goats come by, and um, then I take this away, and they're all going out. The interesting thing about putting your trailer, especially if you want it rewired, is to the wires. So I got my trailer rewired. And rewire it with heavy wire. Don't use this stuff. Um, another way to um, get them introduced is just to put some paneling up where your, your goats are. Bring those dogs in and let everybody walk around, get used to each other, then um, you can just let them go. This is an experience mom. If you don't have experience, then what we do is, um, I don't do this because my dogs are all well out in the brush with hot wire. So what I'll do if I have somebody that buys other dogs, I have them set up a corral, and it's usually a, a corral that nothing can get through. And then we put hot wire on the inside so that when the goats and the dogs decide they're going to leave, they hit that hot wire. The dog, they just want to leave, but they can't because they're hitting the board fence or they're hitting the metal panel and that electric fence is hot. So then what I do is I, I squeeze it in a little bit, I'll move that hot wire in. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I also let it in. <laughs> and so, then you keep squeezing it in and squeezing it in until everybody just stands there and they wait for you to open the gate. They're not going to test the fence again. But we do have an escape place. We have an escape so that I just use one of those big round things that you get from the electric company, the cable company. Um, the goats can get on top, the dogs underneath. You want to be real careful when you're feeding your dogs that you don't feed them close to each other because they like their own dish or their um, feeder, and they will, they will fight to keep it. This is a multi-purpose dog that belongs to Chris Wilson up in Bristol, Jones, Jonesboro. She runs her dog um, with her um, cattle, and you're going to see this um, dog again. They're very versatile. This is um, working with a producer that runs beef cattle, Greg Graham, actually, this is on his farm. He started out with goats and beef cattle. He now has introduced sheep. And um, you'll see that we have this little invisible line right here for about a week. And then everybody finally intermingled. And what really helps out if you have this going on, these little calves, they don't know they're little calves because they want to play with the little kids. These little kids, they want to run around and jump and then the little calves start chasing them, and then they chase the little calves, and the next thing you know, the cows are like, oh man, do I have, really have to put up with all this? And the dogs are just, they're just mellow, they're like, oh, yeah, well, we're with Cobra. Once again, facilitation. Here's another facilitation project. We've got a donkey, we've got a guard dog, we've got goats, we 
have a couple of beefs in here, and there's some sheep somewhere. Sheep's sheep are back here. Um, and they're on uh, turnips and grass and other, bra other grass and other plants. So everybody's just kind of working together. They just work as a mob. But it's really interesting when this mob goes out, the cattle get the grass, the goats go into the blackberries, and the sheep, they're just kind of in the middle. They're just like not knowing which way they want to go. This is one of my favorite pictures. Look at the peacefulness out here. They're all spread out. This is the um, guard dog that does all the roaming around. There's a couple other guard dogs. Here you can see this um, tail up right here. So there's other guard dogs that are within the mob, but this is the dog that's the, he's kind of the guardian watchdog. And so once again, no stress. So we want to facilitate these dogs so that they can work together. And they will. You have to sometimes have to to see who's going to work with who and how well they're going to work together. Um, I use border collies to uh, muster. Um, this is a Huntaway. This is a New Zealand tracking dog. The great thing about this dog is if you're working in a lot of pine trees or other types of forests and you have goats that escape because some helicopter flew over and they can't tell where the helicopter noise is coming from and it just scares them and they check out, then you can take your hunt away or your tracking dog and you put them on the trail and um, find them for you. You can hear her when she tells you where they are. She'll speak and whistle. She'll start bringing them back. Because remember, then you've got a whistle if you're working in the woods but you can't see your dog. They can't hear you. You can scream at the top of your lungs, but they can hear the whistle. So these dogs are all trained to whistle and um, they will bring those animals back toward you. And then you can send out the border collies and the border collies will bring them back. So I stand there, I've got this little counter. I stand there and I count them and I go, hey, we're like 10 short. So you send her back out. <laughs> Very expensive to have a finished hunt away. They're worth every penny. Here once again, this is the dog you saw that we're protecting um, Chris's um, beef cattle. She's got two border collies. She's got a border collie over here, border collie down in through here. Um, so she's mustering her sheep down the hill. This was an interesting project because when we got there, there weren't any sheep. So we walk all the way up to the top of the hill. But you know me, I'm a nice person, so I went and we had to hike up this hill. And all the sheep are on the other side, so Chris sent out motor collies and the bar dog mustering along. And we don't just run them down the hill. We work these dogs across the hill in a zigzag pattern so that when they get down here, they're not out of breath and they're just walking along. We didn't have any weight loss on the land. This is my health maintenance program. Um, you need to talk to your own veterinarian about um, this. Um, because I do raise pups. I'm very protective. And I have a close farm. My farm is close. Um, we do a lot of uh, prevention against parvo. Also, leptospirosis. We have a lot of deer. So I don't want my goats getting um, any lepto problems because it is an abortion disease. Um, we have to, you have to rabies vaccinate. I can microchip everything, start them on heart meds. And then um, at one year of age, I call neuter and spay. And that has to do with um, epiphyseal plates and closure and avoiding any type of bone problems. And this is just my annual um, program for vaccinations. Uh, we want to find out what diseases are in your area based on ticks. We have ehrlichiosis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We have Lyme disease. We have um, Lone Star ticks. And we have the new patient tick. So um, if your dog gets lethargic and he's just kind of like, you know, well, yeah, maybe I'll go to work today. Pull some blood, take it into your vet. Well, if you have a vet, you do that.
or you take the dog in and say, hey, my dog's just lethargic. We've had Rocky Mountain in our dogs, and um, we've had endotheosis. Haven't had mine, but yeah, a lot of times you'll have um, on the third eyelid, um, you'll, you'll see a dog that just has kind of weepy eyes. And um, what I figured out is I just take a Q-tip with some saline on it, and um, I just kind of poke their eye a little bit. That third eyelid comes over, and I can just go under that eyelid and um, pull out all kinds of junky vegetation. This is um, because I, I whelp out. Um, little puppies have no sharp claws, so what I had to do here was um, take care of the mum, and I didn't want these pups to know that um, I was a part of this deal, so they, this was their little hideout. I wrapped her whole butter in a bath towel, and then I duct taped it. I actually used vet wrap, and then um, fed the little pups in pans, goat milk, and I let the mum come over by these little guys, but they never got to drink off of her. Another facilitation trick. Um, once again, they like their their own feeders. This is um, up on a big forestry project. Um, yes, I have several of out there, and uh, they all they go right to their own um, feeder. Um, the reason we say no animal um, ruminant byproducts is because of um, the BSE problem. We don't know how well we're going through this process. Nutrition is real important, but um, so are these um, developmental diseases. You need to make sure that if you're buying younger dogs, that they have been test tested for, um, they've got the official OFAs. Well, they can't do official OFAs until they're two years old, but you want to know that the mum and the sire have their official OFAs, and that they have also had their own shoulders um, checked. And um, this is another one that across on a couple of different farms was um, problems with their elbows. Um, these are other options. Some people like um, donkeys. I'm not really um, hip on donkeys. They don't like change. So if they're just with a mob, they're fine. If you put a buck in it, buck in with the does, that's change. So it kind of is pretty hard on the buck. So you want to be real careful when you're starting to do change. They also don't like hitting this change. So you need to have a good, and also if they have a buddy, they buddy buddy, and they do their own thing, they're not worried about what's going on. And also remember, they're not nocturnal. The predators are nocturnal. They work at night. These guys only work during the day. And um, there's a llama. And the first time I saw this llama, I just went mountain lion right there. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to tell you what we do for humans. Fred likes to put these heads in the sand. We decided not to do that. So I was thinking about how are we going to facilitate our human intruders without actually hurting them. <laughs> Humans. So we've got, we've got this little emu. He's just real soft and fuzzy and friendly, and they want to come up and pet him. So then you have an ostrich, and you've got a guard dog, and you put goats in this pen, so we could facilitate somebody that wanted to steal them. So what happens is they sneak through the ostrich. You can't believe how fast these bubbles can run. Pounds the crap out of the intruder with his feet. Beats the crap out of him with his head. The dog likes to nip their butt. We call 911, the cops show up, it's like, got another one. <laughs> Always have a sign up, letting people know that we have livestock guardians on duty. This is a woman. She um, homeschools her boys, so they have this play area. He has an ash bash. He has a great pier, and they share them. That was her way where when they were done their schoolwork, they could go out and play in the fenced yard and still 
understand dogs, and have a good. This is a chart I use. I've seen this before. I, I like to do all the interrelationships with plants, animals, soil, economics. Everything has to fit into this chart in a positive way. You can put down the side, if you're doing dogs, what are your, what are your objectives for your dog? What sizes you go for? What are you in? Blackberries? Vegetation? Are you in thistles? So you, th you think about all the different things that have to be positive to make this work. And if there isn't a positive in there, then I don't do it. This I call my $20,000 chart because one time I decided to fix it. And if anybody have any questions? <laughs>